Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of you to the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Uh, my name is Kathy Garretts, and I'm uh, one of the curators here. Uh, so we're really delighted to welcome filmmaker and animator Kelly Sears here this evening um, as part of our After Image series. Uh, so that's an occasional series that we just love. It gives us an opportunity to bring together a filmmaker and a critic, scholar, or otherwise film lover uh, in conversation following a screening. So tonight, um, after the screening, Kelly uh, Sears will be speaking with filmmaker, archivist, and teacher uh, Rick Prellinger. Uh, so uh, Kelly is known for her collage animations. Um, they draw on material, as you are about to see, um, as varied as yoga guides, military manuals, and first aid handbooks. Much of her work uh, is created by liberating images from their original context, which is, uh, as you can guess, often educational or instructional. And then bringing them together with other images, also unfettered from their original context, to make films that totter between narrative and documentary, um, but also are concerned with instructing and educating, but in a very different way than the originals, um, in a very less, uh, a very different understanding of what that might mean than the originals. Uh, so we're really delighted that she's visiting here from uh, Denver, Colorado, where she teaches in the Department of Cinema Studies and Moving Image Arts at Boulder. Well, I said it as if she was in Denver teaching, whereas in fact she's in Boulder teaching. Um, and I'm going to introduce Rick now, even though he will be coming up at the end. Uh, he teaches at UC Santa Cruz, so just over the hill. Um, has, through some of his ventures, provided images for countless films, including his own, uh, through the Prellinger Archives, which he founded and which was later acquired um, by the Library of Con Con Congress. And it's his, that collection is comprised as of fascinating educational advertising, uh, industrial and amateur films, uh, much like the kind of images you see in Kelly's work. Many of them are available through the Internet Archive, and he and Me Megan Prellinger established the Prellinger uh, Library in 2009, which further hi furthers his project of making archives available to the public. So as I mentioned, he'll be joining Kelly after the screening and conversation, and then we'll open it to all of you. So please be thinking of things you'd like to ask. Um, I want to take a moment to thank the Hollywood Foreign Press uh, for supporting this occasional series, After Image. And now it's my real pleasure to introduce and welcome Kelly Sears. Thank you all for sitting inside on this beautiful, beautiful night in the dark. I'm excited for us all to sit together. Tonight's program is a selection of 10 films that have been made over the past 11 years. And there is a structure tonight with a, a frenetic arc in mind. And I think we start off in one tonality and slowly move into another kind of psychic tone. I want to say a huge thank you to Kathy for being the person to reach out to organize this and everyone I've been working with at the PFA, Jeff, Holly, and Gibbs, who is rocking the projection booth. And another huge thank you to Rick, um, someone that I love having conversations with whenever I'm in San Francisco. And now we're going to have another one, but on stage. And I look forward to having a conversation with whoever's interested after the program here. Thank you so much. I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, the second to last film, which is called Once It Started, It Could Not End Otherwise, has a little bit of a flicker effect. If any of you are affected by it, look down during it. Thanks. So if Kelly and Rick can come up. So I'd like to welcome Rick Prellinger. 
Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Kelly, for those amazing films. So, um, wonderful to see all that work on the big screen so beautifully. Um, I have all sorts of things to ask you, but I guess maybe one of the obvious things to begin with is this question of language, visual and, um, and, and verbal, the language of surveillance, power, bureaucracy, visual control. Um, how did, how were you drawn to that? And where has your interest in that taken you? A way to talk about that is I don't know how to follow any recipes in cookbooks. <laughs> and I think once I started making the work and thinking about it, it what ties it together, it's this idea of rejecting an idea of the official or of a set uh, narrative. And I think those kind of ideas um, both bridge the instructional imagery, which is, you know, detourned, and the instructional directive language, which you can resist, as well as thinking about these um, American archetypes we have associations with and ways that those archetypes can deviate from intended meaning or more official contexts. Um, bringing that together with um, captions, I like the I like the tension or how you can rift with a image and a caption that might be oblique or might run counter to the image, as well as thinking about derailing a documentary mode of advice, uh, mode of address that takes you from a place that you can locate to a place that seems very foreign. Or did people hear that? Are you able to? Yeah, good, good. Sometimes the mics are a little um, funky. But so at the same time, um, hearing that, uh, there's a great deal of pleasure in that language. There's a great deal of pleasure in the distanced discourse of manuals and of, uh, of, of surveillance and how to the diagrammatic. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a, I would say there's a delight for me in making these as well, and um, there's a play with it. And as I started working with animation, it was this very simple pleasure of making something do something it was not supposed to, and working visually or narrative to do that. But thinking about, you know, when I teach my students, I tell them they're all in their films. And, you know, you know me, I have a very jokey, goofy, um, sense of humor and that, you know, thinking, even thinking about ways Breck talked about epic theater, you know, that there, that I think humor is a very, can be a very critical tool as well. And that there can be things that are pleasurable in a work, but also things that speak to a form of resistance at a work. And those two things can coincide. Um, well, we could talk about defamiliarization, but let's talk about resistance. Um, I'm, I'm fa so, you know, I talk about this too, I teach found footage, and I'm fascinated with the distance between um, collage as a tool of analysis and as a means of deconstruction, but also as resistance. There are some makers who would think that um, rearranging imagery um, uh, or you know, violating continuity is inherently a kind of resistance. I think you're doing something a little different here. I'd love to hear your... Um, your take on, on collage as a practice of resistance? I think, you know, if you think about collage or maybe montage, I think about, in some ways, if we think about found footage, I think of that more as a montage practice, where I think two things are adjacent to each other and some um, meaning comes at that scene. You know, it's very much Eisenstein, but also just thinking about working on a linear uh, video track. Whereas collage for me starts thinking about uh, more of a vertical cinema or kind of a vertical conversation. And instead of having one point uh, where media touches each other, you know, many of those frames have 20, 30, 40 layers in them. And thinking about what happens if you cut into something, not just using the clip, but if you remove the background, that's a very different gesture than putting that clip next to something else. And I think that 
in the subtraction, there's always a process of addition as well. So then what are you putting in? What was that? Subtraction is growth, as I like to hear. Yeah. yeah. And so then it's a way of, of kind of thinking about, um, you know, when I teach animation, I really talk about it as a very critical practice. And, you're, you know, here you're just cutting things out. Um, you're cutting things up. And I think of it, you know, as a way of activating or responding to something that is the static image. And that's a way through multiple layers and depth that the image pivots. And I think in that pivoting, there is a lot of potential to introduce new ways of reading it. There's that. And there's, um, when I think of activation in your work, I also think of repetition. Loops, I thought of uh, my bridge, actually, quite a lot in Body Besieged, um, except that my bridge's backgrounds are, um, are, are graphs, and yours are um, op art. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I think a lot of this actually, the first animation I made was actually, I, I wanted to get into animation, and I didn't necessarily have any training in it, and I photocopied Moybridge's motion studies and cut them out and started um, tweaking the sequence. And I think I had to write about it as like perverting the sequence and where there's, you know, there, there's a number and there's an idea of studying this as uh, human locomotion and there's an idea of a natural sequence. And so I started kind of rearranging the sequences, making them unofficial sequences and thinking about how you can change the meaning by subtly reordering how something should move. But there's a lot of Moybridge in there. There's a lot of Etienne Jules Murray in there as well. Um, and thinking about kind of those superimpositions in the frame, multiple moments of time existing at one, you know, in one, one unique frame. Yeah, and um, also a sense that um, there's almost an unconscious to a lot of these images that's revealed in the in the modification in the activation. And I think that's also where the idea of loop comes from, and thinking about feedback loops or trauma loops, and the idea of things that are suppressed and like this return of the real things that seep through the scrims in the background of voice in the line, some tension that's kind of always there in the architecture of the high school and once it started, um, in applied pressure, these kind of moments that start to seep out of these uh, massage sequences that are there. There's always, I feel like, something under the surface of each frame. And that's another understanding of a sense of a vertical construction in the frame. Massage, mis misogyny. Um, that was a very timely piece. I. You know, I always, I'm always kind of on on the prowl, and I'm always in secondhand stores, kind of taking books here and there. And I picked up a hi, um, a massage book at some point because I always love these books that come with instructional sequences that are visual. It's almost like it's a it's a ready made animation, and um, I had it sitting in my studio. And that was the week when uh, the Weinstein accusations started. And so that production continued through the Nasser trials. And so a lot of the conversations about trauma and the body um, were very present making that piece and thinking, negotiating a place between healing and, um, and trauma between those, the, using the massage uh, instructions as a vehicle for that. And yet applied pressure seems to be a, a do I read it as you would in saying it's a certain kind of triumph at the end over manipulation, or is it? Uh, I didn't have that. Yeah. Really. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, there. Was, there was a very specific arc I was thinking of in terms of making it, in terms of kind of almost the uh, the danger in there was, was kind of being shoved down, mm. and then it kept com coming up to the surface, and. Um, the, the hands become more present on the body, and eventually, actually, the, the male masseuse's hands disappear, yes. and it's just this like self-internalization that's happening with the woman's hands on the body, and the voice disappears, and it becomes, you know, this woman who I think actually looks like a cadaver mm -hmm. <laughs> at the end. But mm -hmm. I, I was thinking it was about a process of dissociation over the course mm -hmm. of the hour. But I like that there is a triumph right into there, and that's great if that's what. Uh. <laughs> Well, it maybe it's a completely unintended and probably wrong reading. Um, 
you mentioned uh, Marais. Can I bring up another French man's name? Um, sure. Chris Marker. Uh, you know, the, the, the form of address in some of the earlier work in, um, uh, in, in The Drift and in um, Voice on the Line, there's that sense of, um, again, you know, in the Brechtian sense, it's a very epic narrative that's reported. Uh, it's not a, a it, it's a narrative that in some ways is dissociated and, and, and rather cold and evidentiary, but of course it's backed up by sound design that plays on the feelings, but um, talk about, if you would, uh, building uh, sort of a story that way. I think it's uh, it's very compelling. So the, um, the voiceover, I would say, all the voiceovers you heard there were actually weaving mechanisms where I had certain images and using the voice was a way of actually making some cohesion to these worlds, which were made up of so many different kinds of fragments, but trying to take all these fragments and make almost these diegetic collages um, where those worlds could exist. Um, and the voice was in all of them, I think, in, in different ways in all of them, was a voice that maybe we would associate with a voice of authority in the first part of the film, but by the end, it's one that we has, has maybe led us astray. And there is a kind of drift across all of them, and they use the voice very differently, where um, Anthony McCann, who's an incredible writer and poet, I heard him reading, and his voice is has this kind of gravel in it that I love, and so he gets a little more, there's a gravitas that builds over the course. With voice on the line, it was, you know, again, same with the drift, taking bits of understood American history or stuff that very pop we can access and then really veering off of course and working with Hugo Armstrong, the actor there, and having his voice get more sensuous and the words lascivious and just kind of having the language, you know, not be the kind of tone or vocabulary that you would associate with more of a kind of instructional film. And, you know, I had thought about casting a woman for the voiceover from there, but I thought it was almost too close to think about these, you know, these women's voices that you were imagining and, you know, just almost these sirens in a way, um, these gongs, sirens. Um, and it was, I actually needed not to have a woman's voice in there. And with the rancher, um, that grew out of a project that was commissioned by the Contemporary Art Museum Houston called Mess with Texas, and they asked Texas artists to, to um, we could get three films from the Texas Archive of the Moving Image, which is a really great archive. And I had, you know, I'd read long ago, I'll admit, one and a half tomes of the Robert Caro uh, <laughs> LBJ series, and but I loved um, that he became an archetype. So that film's not necessarily about LBJ. It was about a more recent uh, president from Texas, and it's very different watching it now in 2018. But the voice there, um, there's something unsound in all those voiceovers. There's something that does lead you off the course you think you're supposed to be on. And that's, that's also kind of a way of making a story do something it's not supposed to. Well... This segues into something that um, I would call sort of the cosmology of Kelly Sears. Um, there's distortions, <clears throat> as in um, as in the rancher. There's uh, there's uh, breaches of the space and time continuum. Uh, there's there's voices and sounds from space that control people. Um, the uh, dimensionality as we know it and the laws of physics are sort of up for grabs. Uh, can you talk about your interest in sort of, um, uh, well, let's say distortions of the continuum that's in so many of these films? I think um, there's a couple things. One, animation uh, is a genre where you don't have to obey any of the laws of this universe. Like there's no gravity in animation. There's no wind. You know, you can make bodies um, and things like that do whatever they need to do. But uh, you know, these ideas of time, space, dimensional discontinuities, uh, it's 
there are narrative structures to further disrupt these images that we already have, um, maybe even at this point, banal associations with, you know, you must, if you watch Voice in the Line, you're thinking about bell telephones, I bet, as you're seeing some of those images, and you're thinking about this moment, um, you know, where these might exist as an industrial film, where the kind of, banal is one word, but maybe ordinary, or, um, quotidian. Quotidian, that's a perfect way to put it. These quotidian images become almost the like the straight man to play these um, imp these moments of the impossible off of. And it almost reassures you, like, I know that image. So maybe these weird turns we're taking could possibly happen too. So with, say, it's, it's part of your toolbox. Yeah. Uh, cosmology is part of your toolbox. You wouldn't uh, think of yourself as perhaps a an investigator into new realms of science? No, I don't think so. Um, well, I, I admire your lack of presumption. <laughs> Many filmmakers would just latch right onto that. I mean, I, I think it's more of these playful moments of yeah. like, could the world, could there be a world where this happens? Could there be a world where this happens? And kind of always, I think, across many of them, teetering the idea of experimenting with these images that uh, this is a very, that read as documentary, that read as nonfiction, and then putting them in contexts where they don't act in the ways that those images you would expect them to. Well, there's a, a neat progression from the, you know, the camera and the spirit world and then photogrammetry and this idea of intel from the future and what is the, I wrote down, secure dominance over space and time. And then by the end, it's security takes priority and we're looking at double Cuisinarts, you know. So in a sense, it puts sort of all of that um, uh, in its place. But, um, you know, uh, the drift, uh, I, I watching the drift this time, I felt as if uh, that uh, something good had happened. You know, the world, uh, it's again cosmological because it's entropy. The world kind of slows down, the world wears down, but it's like what we needed. It's sort of a slow something manifesto. Yeah, I think actually there was this idea of, you know, we decided, the we, uh, we decided that it wasn't about these ideas of national bravado that we didn't need to keep proving something bigger and bigger, um, and that just even small, you know, things that had wonder of just leaving the world, because that's great. We don't have to make it the biggest leaving of the world, and that collectively everyone had turned their back on this mission, even the astronauts, you know? And I do think that that one is actually one of the more hopeful ones in the program, and that we've recalibrated or reset by the end of it, you know, that there was this, this fervor that, and fever that cooled down by the end, and everyone is back in their bodies and um, maybe has learned something by drifting out of them for a little while. Yeah, it may be a, uh, a better and more, <coughs> excuse me, better and more grounded uh, futurist film, mm -hmm. perhaps, than, than other yeah, that, that films are resonates with me right now. I'm thinking about, you know, when you're making a film, what kind of larger social and political and clim uh, climate that you're in, and you know what you really need to think about going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what else uh, uh, really struck me? Um, you know, I. Forgive me if this is a if this is an unwelcome question. It's a question I think about quite a lot. Um, do you want? To, would you like to talk a little bit about? Um, uh, I use the word collage as a stand-in for many many kinds of 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 work. But do you see that as gendered? Do you see that practice as having? Um, uh, implications that have something to do with gender? A little yes and a little no. I mean, I do think kind of these practices, if you think about quilting, that's a collage practice. If you think about scrapbooks, that's a collage practice. Um, but I'm also, I you know, I'm kind of 
my I've been thinking lately, in two weeks, I'm going to be at the Ottawa International Animation Festival, and I'm going to be in Rick's seat having a conversation with Lewis Clark about um, who did... You can ask him. <laughs> I might. Um, but he, you know, you know, kind of in thinking about his practice, you know, he ad identifies as a collage animator, in, I mean, a collage artist instead of an animator. And so I've really been kind of thinking about my relationship to collage and my relationship to animation just when you, because um, I do identify as an animator and I think some reasons that Lou doesn't is because of the expectations that are put onto animation, you know, that it has these characters, it is for a much younger audience, it is very narrative based and I almost like to identify with animation because of the the exact same reason because it already has all these uh, expectations put on it and I think the more people who identify as animators who resist those or who just aren't interested in making work that way. Um, collage for me became, I'm not, I don't know if I could speak if it's gendered or not. I don't think it's gendered. Or is perhaps, can I be more precise? Yeah. Are there ways, are different kinds of practices of putting images together to you, do they have, um, implications that are gendered. You know, I've often wondered, for example, um, uh, there's a kind of very aggressive, um, uh, rapid fire um, work that until recently was mostly the work of men and it isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of shift is, is, is actually wonderful. Um, but I'm curious if you see kind of a, any deeper encodings. I mean, if it's, a, if it's an artificial or a a, a poor question, you're welcome to let it float to the ground and we'll move on. I can, I can see where you're coming at, especially with these kind of like these kind of bravado and rapid fire, um, lots of images, lots of, but women are doing that too. For me, I, I don't think I have a succinct answer for that. And I think a lot of my earlier work, strangely enough, was very was considered very masculine before the drift there was a piece called devil's canyon about some cowboys and it was you know i think i was very interested in cutting up these these masculine archetypes and thinking about them um, within these different positions of power in the narrative and it became a way of just thinking about authority um, and finding ways to to draw that off course a little bit so yeah yeah. Oh well. Thanks. Um, are is there are there materials that you've been drawn to, and then found that uh, they were too difficult to work with, or too unpleasant to work with, or um, didn't lend themselves in a way to being uh, deconstructed or recontextualized? I'm trying to think what's in my garbage bin. There's so much in my garbage bin. There's like 70 percent of everything I've made is in my. This would be the great question for Warhol's interview. Not what's on your bookshelf, but. What's in your garbage? What's in your bin? garbage, yeah. What's in your uh, digital garbage can that you hit delete on all the time on your computer? I feel like, oh, this might be a really good question. I mean, I, I really just sat with so many kinds of images, and I've, you know, I tell my students that I, I'll make something 20 times horribly before I even get one glimmer of something that could possibly work. So there's a lot of experimenting and and hopefully there's a lot of different kind of experimenting. There's the work that's in the Moybridge category. There's um, work that just like the still image that starts to move. I do, I have often worked with um, the idea of history at a distance, but also thinking about that distance as one marker and a larger legacy and thinking about those images having a very specific um, continuity with present and present trauma. I don't think I would work with images directly of kind of a very visceral present trauma. Once at a q and I had some very strange questions, and I hope there's even stranger ones tonight, um, about, you know, why don't you work with images of 9-11? Why don't you work with images of, you know, all these things that just seemed horrible to work with? And, um, and I always try to kind of engage with if there is a certain social or political or cultural situation, I like to come in it at an angle um, and then really try to build a relationship from 
the history that we see those images in or the moment in time that we locate those images and where we're sitting you know, today. So something else that uh, awoke in my mind when you, in your um, introductory remarks, you said we're going to see a frenetic arc. Uh, and so uh, I tried to um, uh, abide by that and look at the, um, the 10 works you showed as really pieces of a larger work. Have you been attracted to or been thinking about making longer form work? Is that something where you would, a, a, a place where you would feel natural, feel at home? Yeah. I think it would be wonderful. I'd love to see a, a feature. I'm working on a your, feature. You're working on a feature. I didn't know this question is not uh, rehearsed. Can you, would you like to talk about it? This is of, this is of course, this is of course the, um, you know, we're, we're almost at the point where I turn over control to the audience. So this is where I ask, do you want to talk about what you're working on? <laughs> um, there's a, there's kind of really thinking, really coming out of this moment um, and really kind of mapping together a lot of concerns about, uh, you know, anthropogenic concerns, labor, and um, workforce concerns, um, larger land concerns, and there's this feature come that's in slowly building some legs. Uh, it's we get to know an AM radio DJ. We get to know uh, the announcer, the motorsports announcer from the fairgrounds, who also is a Marxist and a union organizer. And we get to meet this r radical radio network um, that is building their own radio communications outside FCC, FCC detection. So it's multiple sets of voices, and um, they're all kind of triangulating this, this moment of crisis that is marked by multiple things going wrong in the speculative Western town, all the horses disappear, the auto factories all shutter, and that there are these bizarre, almost supernatural environmental occurrences. And so all of them come together through these multiple stories. Wow. Looking forward. Excellent. Um, thanks. Shall we? Uh, Thank you, throw Rick. It, Of course. Shall we uh, throw it open to the audience? Do we have mics tonight? We do. Um, so, uh, uh, anybody like to direct any thoughts or questions to Kelly? I see a hand down here. Checking. How did we get so lucky? That was incredible. Did I get so lucky? This is so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. That was incredible. Um, I just was wondering if you have any thoughts or commentary on the first short film where it had a uh, transient opacity of spirits uh, being presented. And um, the camera apparatus was always the image that did not have any transient opacity. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or commentary on the symbolism of uh, cameras, cinema, animation as a whole for capturing the eternal, the ephemeral, um, that which transcends what the human experience can perceive. Ah, we could talk about that for 20 minutes, but that actually, it, the answer is going to address this film and also the one that followed it. Um, I think in a way, a tone halfway between lightness and darkness is the most documentary. It was a little short or maybe nonfiction, it was on the spirit photographer uh, uh, Mumler. And it was, I was really thinking about, originally, this is gonna sound bananas, but that film and In the Vicinity were supposed to be the same film. And it was about, um, I was working with images for all these projects and I started really thinking about, let's think about the, uh, gesture or the apparatus of imaging. And so as I was thinking about this spirit photographer and spirit photography had such a flourish after the Civil War because there was just, you know, so many dead. And then there's this, you know, whenever the new, there's a new technology, you know, 
becomes a portal to something else. And um, I was thinking about the story of the spirit photographer, and I changed all the writing to present tense. And when I was looking for images to work with, I was in a secondhand bookstore and noticed in their photography section the chemical photography, kind of the analog 35 millimeter, it was huge. People were getting rid of those books because they weren't shooting on that kind of film anymore. So it almost became, you know, thinking about um, the camera as a medium to this to the lost time. I was almost thinking about like the film, the piece almost being a seance for 35 millimeter photography. Because uh, that used to be how you took images of your family, you know, it was the way that we image. So, um, so the apparatus is really foregrounded there. The film itself is kind of like an animated gray car, you know, and I was thinking about that almost as being the surface to have a seance of these bodies come and go. So I was thinking about that. I was trying to bring in, you know, those two films have almost the most, uh, you know, space time, spirit world, our world, just kind of con uh, passage back and forth. And I was really thinking another way of w working with the idea of kind of the official way of reading these images and the more almost science fiction way of reading those images. Uh, in the vicinity was thinking about um, collecting information uh, with the apparatus and actually going beyond the apparatus. And it does follow the development of how do we see further and further um, from World War II to the present? So starting with you know, the idea of aerial um, observation, three-dimensional building, taking these stereoscopic images, reading the depth to have more nuanced intelligence information. And then you, know, you start researching and you go down these lovely rabbit holes. And I was thinking about the kind of psychic reconnaissance projects that were happening during the Cold War. And then you know, the rabbit hole turns into like multiple rabbit holes and was reading about a project that actually I looked up again and it's not really on the internet <laughs> anymore, but it was a project that was coming out of, um, gosh, I forget the name of it. Oh, uh, it was called Mind's Eye and it was about building predictive intelligence and um, a smart camera can identify nouns, but they were really working on this predictive intelligence uh, program to identify verbs. And I actually thought about these ideas of narratives. It was really a time where I was thinking about narratives as preempting uh, aggression. Um, and so it's like if you see a person pick carry, um, the most likely sequence next is give. And that's when you terminate something. Um, and so they're thinking about this, um, thinking about it in war. But I was, I was at the same time, you know, thinking about police in this country and the idea of like, the narrative of they were, there was going to be some aggression on me. I was scared for my life. And I was just really thinking about these conflations between larger military technology that started trickling down into police departments. So it was, it was thinking about um, w what's needed to build a narrative to then um, unleash aggression. Phenomenal. Thank you so much. Uh, over there. Hi, thank you so much. Can you turn the one on? Okay. Um, I'm curious because I'm teaching an animation class that's not doing it. We're actually studying it, but from the point of view of the technology and how the technology, I don't know if you've had time to read Tom Lamar's book on the anime machine, mm -hmm. but he actually looks at the animation stand as, in a sense, it's political, how it makes images. And so I'm really curious about uh, several different sequences and how you make them, and then what that, how that makes you think or create differently. So I'm thinking of both the high school one and Drift. Um, where an image is looks like it's still, but it begins to move, or it's very um, it's moving, but it's so slow that then it's still. So it it makes me begin to think about: Are you filming stillness, or is stillness film, <laughs> and and how that changes things on the trauma, the theme, the narration. Yeah. Those are, yeah, that's actually kind of the 
at the core of what I think about when I'm making images. And I think about these ideas of frequency in psychic states a lot. And I'm very interested in what happens when the still starts to move or when the movement becomes a, becomes static. So often, you know, something like voice in the line where there's this very kinetic animated background and there is um, kind of a indexical image in the front that's a little slower, there's a tension between those two. Or the still high school architecture where there's that animated. So I think that there's, um, I always want multiple speeds going on um, in each sequence. And I find, I try to think about what the tension is between those two speeds um, and when that tension or that different frequency then can become embodied in the figures that you see in the frame. The drift and, you know, I, I try to make a different technique for each film to engage with um, the content or what am I, the questions I'm asking in each film. And those in some ways have one similar strategy, but also have a um, very different strategy where the drift, and that's one of the, a much earlier piece, was thinking about what happens when you make a film with just stills and you almost, oh, you bring them back into real time and what kind of possibilities that opens up. Um, and then the high school one was also thinking about kind of a static background and I photographed, I was living in Houston then and a lot of that was inspired by the deep water horizon um, oil leak was happening and it was just like all these images of black sludge um, washing up and I was really just kind of had that visual in my mind as I was making that. And um, you know, I was thinking about trauma in that piece and was thinking because I had been collecting yearbooks I don't know why I just started buying them but I bought one from 1974 and I was looking through it and all the candidates I thought all these kids get freaked out and I started using that you know that well now cameras are ubiquitous and we kind of know how to hold ourselves in front of them but back you know before they were everywhere these are the people on the high school yearbook staff who are sneaking up um, on the people so thinking about kind of using those images, how do you build an environment for those bodies to be in that reflects maybe an underlying psychic state? And then to actually go back to a question that Rick brought up about space and time um, and connecting it with this question, you know, animation is um, working frame by frame. There's multiple times in every frame. And I think that when you don't have one sense of linear time, you really have a lot of opportunities to experiment with ideas of how time exists and adjacent to that, how space can be constructed. Um, and those are things that we can recognize visually in the frame, but I think that there are ideas of space and time and storytelling too, and trying to figure out a way to create a relationship between space and time and the visuals and space and time and how you understand the story unfolding. Gosh, um, wherever you think, uh, there's a question right there I see. And there's one over there, and I don't even know what's in the, in the heights yet. Hi, um, my name is Carolina. By the way, that was absolutely incredible, um, just like what my classmate said. Um, but I was wondering, you were just talking about collecting um, instruction manuals at thrift stores, or like you just mentioned, uh, yearbooks. Um, and I was wondering, how do you begin the process of playing and creating narratives out of those either like super um, corresponding materials or very I guess, um, dif different. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's kind of the fun part, is the play part. Um, but often there will be something visually that is engaging me that I, th I think, huh, I wonder what that would look like if I did this. And that's kind of the start of most of these. Um, the voice in the line, I wonder what it would look like if I made a collage out of moving images. And I went on to the Prelinger archive and I found these incredible films and I thought that these women could anchor the stories. What would it look like if, you know, I animated these random um, EMT manuals of people with pencils in their eyes? You know, what would it look like if I tried to make a body that was floating in space? So there's always some sort of question that is anchored on some sort of visual material that I'm responding with, responding to. There's so many, you know, as I was making films, there's 
and as many of you know in this audience, there's so many ways to make films. And I actually have a lot of fun riffing off of an image. And it's kind of the way that I engage with the world is that I think about a way to respond to something or thinking about a way to activate a phrase, a visual. And there's always sets of questions I think I have going through life. And there's these moments that, um, of synchronicity in a way that those two come together. Yes, I have a massage book in my room when this happens. Yes, I come across this yearbook and five years later, I kind of think about there's this thing happening underwater and I'm thinking about all the business practices and cut corners that got us here and I get back to this, you know, somehow work my way back to that moment. Um, but it's always knowing that there's questions you have and that there's material out there and, you know, whatever that material could be, it could be fabric, it could be, you know, whatever, but it's a way for you to ask some of the questions or think about some of the things that are in your head visually. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, wonderful, Emmanuel. You can hear me, right? Thank you so much. I, and some of this I have seen before and every time they are fascinating and amazing. And I have a question that actually ties in with the answer, with the end of the answer that you gave two questions ago. So about how, what is your process of writing? Because to me, for example, for the voice and the line, there, there is almost a, a short story that stands on its own. That I mean, I could read it on paper and it's still fascinating. And uh, the same goes with the ranch. I mean, there are, and then th there is an interesting relation that falls on in, in the, the one in the high school in which you suggest, and now there is an image that whatever comes out, and then we have, we, we, we rely on the images to see, right? Or there is a film that was saved and we want to get the film. But there are some that I, I, you can put them in a book and they're beautiful written pieces that can be of literature for me. So, and I am on the film, I'm involved with the film at the school. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, first off, thank you for making these and discussing them with us. Thank uh, you for so coming. What stood out to me was sort of your exploration of these masses to see of control and authority compared to uh, almost individual rebellion. Um, and so I guess my question is, what led you to want to explore these themes? And specifically, like the CIA, uh, almost secretive, I, I don't know. I got the sense. It's never addressed as the CIA. It's a covert central yes, agency. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think I don't know. Being alive, <laughs> you know, kind of thinking about just hearing. Um, there's a story. There's stories on near the story. There's stories to the side of the story, and it's also just ways of kind of making sense of things we hear, things that come out years later, reading about history, reading about political history or social history, and finding ways to make sense of all of it as a person, as part of a larger society, um, and building bridges between those two things. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's just a way of, you know, I mean, in a weird way, it comes back to that first statement, I don't know how to follow a recipe in a cookbook. Like, I don't necessarily try. Not that I don't, tr maybe I don't trust it. It just doesn't work for me. And it's a way of thinking about um, are there other bits of recipes I can borrow from to tell this story about a moment, moment in time or a moment we're experiencing or a moment from the past that can critically reflect on it and also be, I can have some fun doing it. Maybe with a little humor too. Thank you. Hi, hi up here. Um, I loved your films. Uh, you're an incredible filmmaker. Uh, your massage film really struck me as interesting. Um, the idea of always having, you know, a male presence around your neck, having your oppressor's hands around your neck. And um, I am wondering, in a field that is so largely still dominated by men, do you often have to deal with people? Um, 
drawing your work back to your gender? Uh, yes and no. Again, like there's times there's um, in the audience is Julie Wyman who teaches at UC Davis and you know it's been putting together um, along with Irene Lustig at UC Santa Cruz um, a female experimental film archive of interviews and I think that there's ways that again I think of animation as critique um, it doesn't necessarily get brought you know there's some pieces that resonate more applied pressure absolutely the body besieged sure the drift maybe not so much uh, pattern for survival not so much and so I think a lot of the conversation is steered by the material that I'm working with in each of the films and you know the questions that I'm bringing to day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day animating engage many different kind of crises and so it really depends on the film but not necessarily um, it's, a, it's an interesting question because sometimes it does get put in those categories and sometimes you know thought about as uh, a feminist practice and sometimes that doesn't ever come up and I think it's also dependent on who's looking at it if those are the questions that they have or or not great thank you we have a question down here ah uh, yes here comes the mic this is Maggie. Hi, I, Maggie. Oh, yeah. And I was brilliant. I really loved it. It went a little bit too fast for my brain, though, because I would love to see it again. Uh, and uh, it's one of those things that is not the thing that unfolds in time, but it's one that, just, you know, it's the last work. But um, uh, I think that, that uh, I wouldn't want to draw any conclusions from, from that, this little blast, you know, the whole big blast. I, my first feelings were the kinds of things I had as a child during the Cold War. And, uh, you know, that it was, it was true to the blast that it was. And I was, as a child, I was taken to the library in the library. And, uh, and it, had, it struck me that I couldn't look at that door and really see the whole thing in that Mm -hmm. it, that just wanted to happen to me. So that makes me wonder if it was more about uh, this kind of constant strife all the way through the film, that it never had that experience. Mm -hmm. But it was it was sort of joyful at the same time. And I think that uh, that the blast and the big and the bad have to dance together, not that they don't have Thank you. And, you know, these films are made from the present, you know, so just thinking about, say, the film The Drift that was made, you know, during our occupation in Iraq, you know, f in 2004, we had that uh, banner, Mission Accomplished, and it was about these kind of like, these kind of uh, occupations in the, in the name of democracy. And, you know, so, so even if you said that there was a release, you know, if some things might have come out in the release, the... Um, Voice in the Line was made, you know, in a moment where we had the Patriot Act and kind of thinking about just communications. And so it's not that any of these are in the past. You know, they're all made from an origin in the present and they grow tendrils to these images of another time that were helpful for me to speak about what was going on in the present. So what about uh, what we have now with our president and so is that has that been leaked into whatever you were doing, or is it, let's get out of this, this thing we spent money and research and came up with this it's career that's, it's just totally poisoned by it, so, yeah, it's also uh, uh, pretty very, very near fascist, and so, uh, you know, I just, I, you know, I would love it if we could somehow uh, get out of the kind of feeling that's going on constantly, and it doesn't seem to get anywhere. It's, uh, I would say, the, the new piece that I'm working on that is probably the most hopeful to date and the most intersectional in thinking about how um, economics um, and politics and social concerns are so intertwined into the psyche of a place.
there's a hand here. And oh, thank you. Yeah, hi. I was um, curious. Uh, at what point, when you're um, putting the film together, what point do you introduce sound? Are you doing a, an assembly of a rough cut and just assembling it without sound? Or have you picked some sounds or music? Or? Uh, sound comes and goes, and um, it's always visual first, and I have to think about what tonal frequencies the images are making, and that deals with time, that also just kind of deal. it has a lot of, um, in the construction, it starts to give me a frequency that I'm hearing, and then that later goes into sound, and sometimes it's back and forth between the two, but often most of the visuals are done before I start the sound design. Um, and more and more, there's, there's films I've worked on with sound, um, help from other people, but for me, it also becomes just another layer of collage. And once I started realizing that, um, it became a way to think about how do I, you know, I think about sound very much as the psychic space of the film. And so once I understand what kind of frequencies I'm hearing visually um, and where that's resonating, I start to build a sound collage that can engage with it, hopefully d do something a little different than the images, but um, brings the, um, in maybe a place where anxiety is worked out even more so than the visuals. Just for a follow up, um, you work up with a lot of found footage. Uh, does your sound um, choices, do they tend to be found as well, or do you actually record them? You know, for the new project, I'm going to do Foley, but applied pressure was um, all water meditation sounds I downloaded, and then Foley of waves crashing and waves crashing more dangerous sounding, and then eventually of sounds of, of drowning Foley. Um, and so I was very much interested in, you know, how do I activate these sounds that could be totally innocuous, could suggest some sort of diegetic world where, you know, there's a, a pleasant lake, you know, and, and not use them in those ways. Yeah. We have time, I think, for a couple more questions. What's that? One more. We have time for one more question. Um, Okay, so we have time for two questions. One in the back and one in the front. Hello. Um, excuse me. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, I really enjoyed your film. Um, excuse me if my question is a bit, I guess, elementary. I'm very new to this subject. But um, I'm from, this is Professor Mizer's class, uh, and we're studying like animation theory and like the whole idea of like the apparatus. Uh, so one thing that Lamar was talking about in this thing, uh, in his theory, was that it, with the introduction of technology, there also within like the daily life, is there's also an introduction of like speed. And I noticed in your first film, um, with the cameras and the motions, like the background was very like fidgety, and there was a lot of like blurry sort of static motion. Uh, was there like a meaning to that, or yeah? It's, so I, I was thinking, you know the mid-tone of middle gray, you know, thinking about it between, on a tonal scale, space between light and dark, but also thinking of that as a metaphor between this conduit between a living world and a deceased world. And so it almost becomes um, an animated texture that, um, you know, if you're thinking that there's a seance happening, it allowed these very still images to come out of, um, that I wanted the the figures in the backgrounds to almost blend together so th that, you know, the idea was to produce a ghostly effect between those two. But thinking of it, um, one, as, as a device to do that, but two, just something that's very visually satisfying to me is to have something moving in the frame and having something still in the frame and having those two kinds of speeds coexist together. Thank you. And... Our last, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, well, as everyone else here has said already, thank you for being here. It's been very humbling and such a privilege to see what you have, the work that you've given us so far. Uh, I have a, what, what I would say, a much more simple question. Uh, it's about the high school film. First off, what was the name of that film again? I forgot. It's the first and last time I name a film after 
a Henry Kissinger quote. Okay. It was called, Once It Started, It okay. Could Not End Otherwise. And he was talking about um, the unraveling of the Nixon administration and referred to it like a Greek tragedy. And once it started, okay. it could not end otherwise. Yeah. Well, um, I was just really curious, what exactly was it that happened at that high school? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you even know yourself. <laughs> and uh, what was the inspiration behind the idea? Whatever you think happened is the exact thing that yeah. happened. I mean, that film's been read um, in a lot of ways where people have said, thinking politically about what was happening in the 70s, kind of the failure of the left and this movement into like the Reagan 80s. I'm reading all this, and that's a great way to read it, too. But I also know that I'm going to assume that largely most of the bodies in this room have been through a high school. And I was reading, aside from just doing, um, you know, politically thinking about that moment, that moment had the most um, on-edge high school kids than the candidates, and that's why I, I kind of anchored it in that year, thinking about why are these kids so freaked out? And I was like, well, of course, for all these reasons. But I was also reading a lot of... Um, books about high school and trauma um, and the virgin suicides, the graphic novel Black Hole, um, and just thinking, you know, now I live in a state um, where, you know, the Columbine shooting happened. And so I was thinking that are there connections of c the coming of age, the impressions of the institution on these young bodies? Um, it was really... I mean, I was, there was something really, think, I was really thinking about oil and regulations and neoliberalism and cutting corners as all this oil was just gushing in the Gulf. And there was, they call it the energy industry in Houston. The day it happened, there was a huge conference and everyone's just hanging out in bars. Like no, everyone was there. Like no one seemed actually concerned with what was going on. And like that seemed like such a horror show to me. Um, I don't know, what do you think happened? So I'll uh, leave that to my imagination in a, in a week from now. The shark in Jaws is so it. much scarier until you see it. So it's kind of like if I showed it to you, if you heard what the drift actually sounded like, if you heard what the voice, the operators actually sounded like, if I told you exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Was there also an inspiration behind like some of the humor that appeared in it, like the mascot went missing? That was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that you think the mascot had something to do with it? Well, like, no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> No, I'm just like more like more directing towards like there was actually a bit of a like, there was actually a bit of humor in that film and it, and even though the idea was was like uh, it came across as really dark, you still found found a way to weave a little bit of humor in it like, at least from my and uh, I'm and glad. I, I mean, I hope that there's for, you know, uh, I I kind of really there's always these moments of uncomfortable laughter sometimes at the screening, yeah. wondering, I think this is funny, uh, maybe, and I'm I'm okay with that that unfocused place. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Kelly, thank you for taking the time to join us. Thank you for your openness and all your revelations tonight. It's wonderful to uh It is to, always to so lovely you. to chat with you, Rick. Yeah, thanks. Let's uh, give Kelly the hand she deserves.